Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Elisa Sklar, and I'm the VP of Marketing at GIS Planning. I'm delighted to be here today with my co-presenter, Aaron Bursois from Golden Shovel Agency. Hello, Aaron. Hello, happy to be here. I am so excited to be doing this with you again. I'm trying to remember how many years it's been, at least five years that we've been doing these, these key trends webinars, I think. Yep, I believe so. I think this is number five. I just uh, look forward to it every year. Me too. And I know that this always is one of our most popular webinars of the year. So I'm really excited to be able to, uh, to share that with all of you. So with that, let's get started talking about 10 key trends for economic development websites in the coming year. And I know, Aaron, that when I we went back to, to look at the slides from this year. I was reminded by how little we knew in January 2020 about what was to come in the year ahead, right? I mean, <laughs> thing, that's the truth. I, I like to think we've got a crystal ball, um, but you know, I got to admit, we did not see that coming. And one of the things that we know is that you, you might think you've got the view and then you look closer and suddenly it turns into something else. And clearly all of us were a bit blindsided by the pandemic and all of the things that this meant for economic development and site selection. And so we are going to gaze into our crystal ball and uh, with the powers that we have, uh, we're gonna talk about the trends that we're picking up on. I mean, this was just an incredible year for innovation and creativity as we were all forced to respond to, you know, use one of the cliche terms I promised I didn't want to use, but these unprecedented times. And they say necessity is the mother of invention. And there's no question we've seen an incredible amount of innovation this year. Is it, would you agree with that? I would completely agree. The amount of creativity that's come out of uh, so many economic development organizations as a response to this has um, just really pushed uh, technology and digital particularly in so many directions that um, and, and it's such a faster pace than it was going. A lot of the trends that were we were talking about at the beginning of last year just got accelerated, you know, threefold, fourfold. Right. Uh, it's, it's very well put. I 100 percent agree with you. And so. Um, well, certainly we all have very real and serious and legitimate concerns for prosperity, for business in our community, for FDI and site selection. We're also pleased to see that there's a whole bunch of tools at your disposal. And we can also then talk about what that actually might be for you in those responses. So we're going to count backwards from 10, and then we'll do a roundup at the very end of the top 10 trends. Um, 10 main storytelling this year. I think this is really an enduring uh, enduring trend, something that's really important. We know that storytelling is hardwired into the human brain. Uh, we understand things in narratives. If you tell people something in a story, they are more likely to understand it. They're more likely to notice it and be struck by it. And they're more likely to remember it afterwards. So comprehension, resonance, and recall are definitely improved when we tell anything in a story format. And that's just because our brains evolved to think that way. So it, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. And we know that story is really the content when it comes to out of word marketing. I'll, I'll turn this over to you, uh, Aaron, to talk a little bit about what makes a good story. Okay, one second. I heard there was a little bit of feedback, so I'm going to try to get around that. Can you hear me all right over there? Yeah, that's actually much better. A lot less feedback now. Thank you. Okay, that had something to do with my headset, so there we go. Well, great. Okay. Well, there's an awful lot of stuff to cover today, so let's just jump into it. And one of the things that um, we've been doing more than ever, and, and well, the funny thing is so many of these trends that we're going to talk about today all relate to different ways of telling a story just like you were sharing. And uh, for us, what makes a good story is, is success stories. We want to talk about success stories from our, our communities, but making them where the, the hero of the story is going to be relatable and aspirational to the person you're trying to talk to. So that means that the stories are going to be different depending on who you're speaking with. If you're speaking with the CEO of a company, then that hero is likely to be a, a also the CEO of a uh, company that might be in a similar industry and have uh, 
been able to uh, have some success there in your community. If it's a workforce attraction, which we'll also be speaking about today, that's a very different target audience. And your hero is going to be somebody who's really thriving in your community that relates to the people you're trying to attract. Excellent. Okay. And then I'll go to the next one. Let's see if I can. Uh, there you go. Um, here's just an example of one uh, story that we had run a while, a little while back now, but it was really, really successful. And this is when the Brady Industries brought a, a, a aluminum folding plant for uh, doing aircrafts into eastern Kentucky. Just an example of a story that if you're going to be talking to other aerospace companies, which was what the focus was of this particular article, um, a good example of a company that's that's growing and thriving and chose a, re a region for all of the right benefits, but it's really designed to speak to people you know, that are uh, owners and operators of companies that are related. And then first thing first is once you've got these digital stories, it's getting them onto your websites and getting them out to the people and all of your targeted audiences. And we've seen a lot of examples of these. I put a couple good examples in. This is Roseville, Minnesota, which put in a whole suite of uh, business success stories into their sites. You can go there and, and read them and view them. Uh, Greater Dubuque, Iowa is um, always just an excellent job with their website presence and also shared some really good success stories of businesses. And um, can't quite see it in the screenshot, but as you scroll down, they not just incorporated the uh, a text about the story and the case study, but also videos. And once you've got your story, there's all these different ways, and these are some of the things we'll be talking about today, but ways to, to get that out to the right target audiences. So websites, social media, uh, particularly LinkedIn for business attraction and, and Facebook for workforce attraction, using infographics to tell a story, videos. We'll talk about virtual tours and virtual reality today to talk to share the story, how to present virtually. That's a huge shift this year. Um, that focuses on that. And then also um, how it affects the uh, podcast and search engines. For us, uh, we write so many stories uh, for our clients. I think uh, last I heard, we had over 600 stories in the queue for clients all around the country. And one of the big focuses that we have and things we've recognized is by keeping, the, keeping stories that are written a certain way, you can really increase your search engine optimization. And people can find you both organically as well as uh, being targeted specifically through social media. And uh, lastly, don't forget that storytelling isn't just a written story, but it's also very visual. Um, a story and um, the emotions of the story that you're trying to, to share can really be passed on visually. And I picked out a few sites that this year really tell a story. Um, these are changing a lot as we've been going along because 2021 has shifted how, what people are marketing and the messages they're sending, and we'll be discussing some of those. Uh, but here, like grown in a vibrant region. This is a Tulsa who's had just an excellent year. Uh, Wilmington, Delaware, their uh, economic development office. Uh, when you go onto their site, they have this, real, this nice video banner on the top which really showcases people thriving in the region and uh, just really hip and cool. Uh, Groton, Connecticut, it's a right on a, a harbor and on the coast. And so they really showcase on their site right off the bat what a lifestyle change it is to live live in Groton. And I, I love this one. This uh, definitely speaks to the trends that have been going on this year. And uh, we'll be speaking about that, this exodus from metro areas out to uh, suburbs and more rural regions. Um, this is what it feels like. This is what you want without a mask on and you're more than six feet away from others. You're just, you're close to Seattle, but you're a world away and you're just breathing in that fresh air. Uh, boy, does that look, uh, look refreshing. And one last one. Here's Pflugerville, Texas, speaking to talent and um, really highlighting uh, their region and all the people that are working there in the interest of attracting businesses. 
So, you, I mean, you had some really compelling examples in those screenshots there, Erin, but there's no question that images are super powerful. And if you're going to be spending time with digital marketing, you really need to think about what those images look like. We know when it comes to communicating things effectively, 90% of the information that comes to our brain is visual. And we can understand things visually so much faster and so much better than we can if we actually had to read them. Uh, imagine someone trying to describe to you where Texas is versus just seeing a map with Texas right there. Instantly, you know. And the average person is exposed to so much information every single day that anything we can do to cut through that clutter and cut through that noise and communicate effectively is absolutely critical. So only 1% of all that information is actually going to make it through to our brains. And we want to make sure that people not only notice it, but they also remember things. So presenting it in a visual format is really critical. And the example that I have here on the page is from our new Zoom business tool, which we uh, debuted this April after the initial start of the pandemic. And this is a way to map out and help people filter, see, and find all the businesses in your community that are open, what their restrictions might mean. Is it curbside pick it up only? Is it contactless payment? Do they have a gift card program? If you're looking for a pharmacy or a animal medical clinic, then you can use the filters at the top to quickly and easily do that. So when it comes time to actually helping your local businesses survive and helping your local consumers connect with them, visually, this is so much more effective than just having a list of what those businesses might actually look like. So a great example right there. Um, another example of using data for storytelling here, this comes from the um, intelligence component microsite that we put together for Switzerland. And they gave us layers of all of their uh, startup business angels, uh, incubators, accelerators, uh, VC funds, research institutes, anything that has to do with getting businesses started up and off the ground. And then we were able to map that for them. So clicking on any one of those squares will give you the information about that incubator or that uh, VC uh, organization or whatever that actually is. So it's about documenting in a visual format something that is really important uh, for economic development everywhere. Another example here of visualizing things is almost every economic development organization out there has key industries listed on their website. If you don't, you probably want to think about that. But this is a way to tell that story visually. So instead of just talking about tourism or aerospace or logistics and distribution, our business intelligence component can be loaded up to open up displaying those businesses. And if you click on any one of those dots, because it's interactive, it will give you the name of that business and some information. And now you can see how that key industry sector is dispersed across your local geography. You are instantly conveying such powerful information about the meaning of that sector for your region. Uh, visual storytelling, that's absolutely critical. So that kind of helps us um, I guess, segue from storytelling into visualizing data, because that's clearly what we are doing there. We have a little quote here from uh, Gary Swoop at Vision First, talking about how data is really your community's first impression. So we want to make sure, obviously, that you have good quality data on your website, that it's effective, that it's effectively presented. But to note that more than ever during the pandemic, when people can't hop on a plane or easily come and visit, they're going to be counting on finding good quality data on your site when it comes to making investment decisions. And we know that these site selectors and businesses, they have always been researching your websites before they call or email you. So you don't necessarily know that they're doing it, but that's where they are. They're on your website looking. And so you have to take a good hard look at it and say, what data actually are they gonna find? And the more interactive it is, the longer you can keep them on their website, on your website, so that they can answer the specific questions they are coming to your website with the better you chance you have of making a connection of some kind of leading to more genuine opportunities. We know that when buyers and investors have the ability to qualify themselves, they tend to in real person look at fewer properties because they've done the research and due diligence ahead of time and it has the overall impact of shortening the sales cycle. It saves them time and money, saves you time and money, and everyone is happier at the end of the day. So that's really powerful. When it comes to figuring out what data you need, we've got our little data toolkit uh, example here, 
We know that data, of course, needs to be fully optimized. In these days, we're going to talk about mobile, but it needs to be fully optimized and also uh, fully featured. So you're not sacrificing any functionality um, when it comes to uh, making sure it's mobile. It has to be granular. So you can, must be able to provide that data both at the hyper regional, like the big picture, county level, regional level, metro level, but then drill down to hyper local so that we can give them very detail, like right down to the block group or the zip code. Area. That data needs to be interactive and dynamic. If you're just showing them a static image, it's far less effective than letting them roll up their sleeves and get uh, their hands dirty and play around to answer the specific questions that they have. It has to be presented visually, as we said before, because people are much more likely to notice it, to be impacted by it, to remember it, and also to export it or share it so they can use it. Obviously, it needs to be customized to your specific location. So if you are a, uh, a town and there is a county level data available, but you're always having to extrapolate for your town, less effective than having your own information from the center. Obviously, it needs to be accurate and regularly updated. If you are relying on 10-year-old census data to be able to sell your community or things that are even at this point just a couple years old, they're completely out of date. Nobody's making multi-million dollar investment decisions with old data. It needs to be robust. That means that they need to be able to find as many variables as possible that are important to them. Maybe they're looking for wage data or consumer spending information, occupation data, talent pool data. We want to try and as, get as much of that important. Broadband is one that we're hearing super important right now. Um, you want to make sure that you offer that within your data set. Obviously, it needs to be relevant to your customers' needs. You know, we let our clients are, are welcome to add their own local data layers to our GIS planning maps like Zoom Prospector, but there's really no point in uploading a map of every single manhole cover in town. That doesn't help anyone, so let's make sure that we're offering them the data that helps them make decisions. Easily tracked and analyzed, we want to be able to go back and see who's looking at the data, how they're using it, what they're searching for. And of course, easily exported and shared. And that's why we need to think about the format. If you were just using old school PDFs to share data, far less effective than letting people have a link that brings them back to your website, this website that you put so much energy into perfecting, you wanna bring people back there. Otherwise, I think of it as vampire marketing. You know, It can be wonderful, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't lead to anywhere. It's not bringing them back to you. And that's so uh, that's so important. So being able to share those links back to specific reports really makes a big difference. Um, one of the things that we hear from site selectors, as you can see in this quote from Josh Bayes, is that a current well-maintained sites and buildings database is critical so that they can connect the community information, the location data, to the available properties, what is available in that area. And it's really just absolutely necessary to have those things in there. So just a, a kind of quick overview of the kinds of data you want to think about. Are you offering this to site selectors and potential investors, the demographics, sites and buildings, business and industry data, labor force, broadband, GIS? There's all sorts of really interesting data up there. And these are the kinds of questions that we're hearing. This is what people are really looking for. So you want to make sure that that's up there. And then you want to be able to pair them. So it's not enough to have those things in separate places. People need to be able to go and look for the properties alongside the other thousands and thousands of data points so they can vet the choices on their long list and make their short list and ultimately make that decision. Um, so examples of this would be, uh, for example, here in our demographics report, being able to do heat maps, being able to change radius, do drive time analysis around specific properties or pinpoints on the map. You want to have those creative map tools as much as possible. And then you want to be able to let people go down in there and look for that information around specific points on the map, specific industries, specific businesses or specific properties. Uh, another example here, that in this case, we're looking at labor force. We know workforce is so critical, that information, and it's just a, another way of looking at what that might be. So again, visual, seeing how this data is dispersed across geography, letting people click on those things so they can get more information and make sense of that. One of the things that we did this year was we brought back a completely revamped version of our popular comparison tool that was on Zoom Prospector uh, before we updated it. Now you, at a glance, can compare as many communities as you want from across the country with any geography 
from your region. So if you are a county, you could pick a town, you could pick the county as a whole, and then you can go in and choose as many others as you want, uh, see some key data points on the board like you see on the top left, get these very detailed charts and graphs that let you see what these things look like, and then stack them up in the tables on the bottom as well. So you have these very detailed granular, but also easy to follow comparison uh, charts. Uh, our intelligence components, we have six of them, many of you are familiar with them. These are standalone tools that put the data directly on your different website pages. So many people will have, for example, a, a demographics or a page about opportunity zones or incentives. So you can use this tool and customize it to show at a glance where those opportunity zones are or where, uh, in this case, where grad degrees might be dispersed across your area. Our business intelligence component, and I showed you that example from Choctaw earlier, showing the key industry sector, but there's so much that you can do with this one to actually show anchor companies, industries, clusters, we can do custom clusters and let people understand what that means in your area. Uh, demographics, again, you'll almost certainly have a demographics page in your website. Well, this tool can be uh, added with a little bit of code that you paste into the page. It makes that page so much more valuable. We also know that it helps people find these pages because of course for SEO, these tools are really, really powerful. Uh, and it lets people you know, bring your, your bounce rates down because people are more likely to spend time there doing the research they need to answer the questions they have. The community comparison tool can also be used as a standalone tool, one of our intelligence components. Uh, the infographics tool, these, these are key uh, data put into an infographic, it's basically a snapshot. You can, um, if you're a region, you can change the geography by clicking on the change at the very top there. Uh, and it just lets people see at a glance, they're interactive, there's some time series data, how these things play out across your area. Very popular thing to put on different pages, especially if you have an About Our Community page. And then the talent pool one, which is so powerful because this is really challenging data to source on your own. We hear from our clients that just save so much time that you can show people at a glance from a workforce perspective, degrees conferred, top programs, top universities around a particular area. So these infographics are part of what we've been building more and more into our tools. Uh, we talked about the power of visuals before, how important it is to help people absorb, understand, and remember information. But from a website perspective, we know that infographics uh, they're just great for your traffic. They are going to improve the traffic, they're going to improve time spent on page, and they're going to lower your bounce rate uh, so that people are more interested in spending time on those pages and time on your website to click through to different places. So uh, we're happy to share the slide deck with us afterwards. You'll see that we've put links throughout in the slides, but you can go back and take a look at this as an example from uh, Northern Kentucky. Another example here from the state of Idaho, uh, just to see what those look like. And I'll, I'll pass this back over to you now, Aaron. Oh, sure. Just showing a couple more examples here of uh, groups. This is Palestine, Texas. And um, inside there, they can, they've got all of the intelligence components in there. It's a good example of a, of a site in action. Um, another one I'd like to highlight is Expand Greater Springfield. They've done so much. Uh, they have really active economic development group. You guys know uh, Horton Hobbs up there. They have a whole uh, suite of, the, of all of the GIS planning tools. Um, inside of here and all you have to do is you go click on the site selection and say you want to go down to consumer expenses and there there's the computer oh, they pop right up onto the site so it's pretty pretty slick uh, we've yeah. shared a lot of uh, success with uh, telling the story through data Oh, there we just got a, some other examples of what those tools look like. Again, we're telling the story of the advanced uh, manufacturing cluster in a, in a different area. Um, and I guess that brings us over to number eight, which is mobile. Now, Aaron, I know you and I were chatting about this before. We were saying, like, do we still need to explain to people how important mobile is in this day and age? That, that would seem obvious, right? Yep. And yet... Yes, we still need to have this conversation, don't we? Because mobile isn't always something that we're seeing across the board. Your site has to be completely mobile responsive. But also when it comes to your data tools, you want to think about um, whether they're fully featured as well as uh, mobile responsive. Because we see some examples of data tools out there that you're sacrificing maps or you're not getting all of your reports. And that can be very frustrating to your end users. 
When I look at the analytics for all of our clients, we're seeing that at least 40% of web traffic is coming from these mobile devices. So it's really, really critical that they're given a mobile responsive and fully featured uh, example of what that might look like. If you aren't optimizing for mobile because we surpassed that convergence point years ago, you're actually losing leads without actually even knowing it. Nobody's gonna spend time hunting and trying to pinch and fill in little forms on a desktop site when they're using the tiny screen on their phone or their tablet. Uh, so that responsive de design is just absolutely critical across the board. Example here from Irvine. Yeah, there's a, just a couple more examples. One thing that's nice about responsive design is you don't have to have multiple sites. You don't have to customize one site for mobile and one site for um, like a desktop or another one for a tablet. It can just adjust itself to present it, and that's been uh, that's been best practices for a few years. But like you noted, it's definitely worth uh, mentioning. Um, I saw some data on LinkedIn, and they're well over 60% of people are only using mobile or viewing their uh, their tool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just going more and more and more down that path. And so yeah, I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on it, but if you're sites aren't mobile friendly or the tools aren't mobile friendly, they're being missed by an awful lot of people. So and just a couple more examples. Okay, so that takes us over to lead generation. Um, and as we said, uh, lead generation and tracking, uh, still super important, you need to first of all, make sure that you're sending people to your site so that they're able to find you. Um, you know, I, I often say, because I work individually with all of our clients and we help them launch their tools, is these these tools, websites are not in and for themselves magic bullets. We can do everything we can for SEO and help make sure that the design is fantastic, but ultimately it comes down to how much marketing we're doing of them, ongoing persistent marketing that helps people find them. Um, and we want to then make sure that we're tracking that, what actually is happening at the back end. So one of the things that we always ask our clients is, do you know what companies are visiting your website? It isn't enough to look solely at Google Analytics. Of course, you should be doing that, absolutely. Um, and I'm sometimes surprised when I come across clients who just, they leave that to the website people. But it, it, you know, for all of us, we need to know what's happening uh, when it comes to the website traffic. Then of course, we have our, our Zoom Prospect or, or Economic Development Analytics. What properties are people viewing? What reports are they pulling? What communities are they viewing? And then finally, uh, the reverse IP lookup. And I, I know this is something that you guys work with as well, Erin. Uh, we use Lead Forensics. We call it Lead Gen ID because we've coded it into our tools. But that helps yep. people see what companies are on their website. And that's just a game changer, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so much. Um, uh, Brad, both of our uh, systems use uh, Lead Forensics behind the scenes. And before it was so you could see traffic, which was great. You could see what pages people were going to, but you didn't have any idea who it was that was that was going there. Um, what this does more than anything is validates your marketing efforts. So you can see if you're sending out uh, an article and you're looking to attract food industries. You can see food industry companies coming to your site and doing the sections of the site that are related to them. That validates what you're doing, and it also can give you some tips on who you might want to connect with. Exactly. No, I think that's it's such a game changer because sometimes we have clients, especially from small, you know, we work for everyone from small towns to entire states and, and countries, but quantity of traffic is certainly important, but the quality of the traffic is so important. So I'm just going to go back for one second before we head to that slide. So you want to know actually what companies they are, where, where that company is located, because it will tell you the geography for that specific office, a little bit about them. You can assign it to one of your, let's say you have someone in your office who's in charge of working with life sciences or automotive or manufacturing so that they get an email prompt every time that company comes back. And this is not the same as putting cookies on people's websites. You're not doing that. You're not tracking. You don't get to see what other things they've seen. There's none of that creepiness. In fact, you don't know who from that company is visiting. I would know that GIS planning is on our website, but I wouldn't know that it was Elisa from GIS planning. So you don't need to worry about the creepiness bit. And I usually tell our clients to follow up on it with a customer service approach and say, you know, hey, I see someone from, you know, your company has been spending time doing some research on our website. I just wanted to make sure you found everything you're looking for. Can I offer any assistance? Do you have any additional questions? 
and that tends to you know you may not actually reach the person who was doing the research but if it's important enough they're gonna they're gonna figure that out so I think quite a valuable thing to do did you want to speak a little bit about inbound yeah uh, just to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on inbound but I want to talk just briefly about it because it's made a big difference this year it's one of those digital strategies which has been quite effective and we've been using it with an awful lot of clients the idea behind inbound is, is instead of just putting content out and articles and hoping that people are going to find it, it's about providing value to the prospects so that they want more information and that they're going to come back. And then once you know that they're interested in something, being able to nurture that relationship. So you're not just getting traffic, but nurturing that into leads. And go to the next slide. Got it. Uh, there's a handful of different strategies for, for using this. And I just put a couple of them on here um, that, that we use a lot. The content marketing is writing stories and creating all of those. Uh, that's, uh, that's at the beginning of all of this. Getting uh, what some types of, uh, of products that really create value are things like white papers. Like maybe it is a white paper on the success of a business that moved in or um, a webinar with a, highlighting the CEO of a particular um, industry that you're targeting. Uh, the social media marketing, putting those articles out and targeting the, the people so that they come back. And then you, once they've come back to your site, um, you know, you're, you're providing them values so that they exchange some information like their email address or the like. Um, and from there, you can connect into things like HubSpot, which HubSpot um, will track the IP address where everybody is going. So in, as your visitors come, um, if they came in from that aerospace story that I showed in the beginning, for example, you now know that that person is interested in aerospace. You know if they've been on the Facebook page or the LinkedIn page, what sections they might have been on in the site. And then you can start nurturing that. So you could say, hey, we're going to have a webinar about the aerospace industry in this area and uh, share it with that person. Or maybe there's an infographic um, or part of your email marketing might be targeting uh, just people that are interested in aerospace. That's, um, that's what's possible with inbound marketing, but it comes down to creating value uh, for the uh, potential leads in order to nurture them until they're ready to make a decision. Excellent. Uh, so just a, a, this is an example of um, something that we've been doing uh, with uh, Maryland. It's a new site that they just launched that's about Opportunity Zone specifically. So they have a Zoom prospector for uh, all of their sites and buildings, but in this case, they're showing specifically uh, for opportunity zones. And from a digital marketing perspective, this just makes good sense because they're providing value. They're doing that kind of outreach for something that we know is so important, but also particularly important for the state of Maryland. And one of the things that they're doing here that's a little bit different is that they're marketing not only sites and buildings, but also companies and investment opportunities for sale. So it combines all of these things together. You can filter them out and look at them in different things, but you can see that this, these are opportunities, they call it Opportunity Maryland, not just for the incentive zones themselves, although that's where these things are located, and not just for sites and buildings, but is an interesting departure to look at um, businesses as well. Uh, and again, just an example here of being able to search out, to drill down into the business and industry data. If this is something that you want to promote, to actively put that information out there, uh, being able to showcase that in different ways. Um, another example of an Opportunity Zone site, this is for uh, Connecticut, uh, the economic development, they have something called their site, find, CERC, site Finder Opportunity Zone Property Search. It's very important for them. They're able to monitor this in different, to, to market this very directly by having a dedicated site for it. So number six is microsites. And I'll let you say a few words about this beforehand, lead us into this, Aaron. Sure. Uh, this is all done the same theme of targeting an audience. Uh, I put in parentheses targeted audience sites to be more clear. It doesn't mean that it's a small site. A microsite is just a website. Uh, sometimes they're smaller. Uh, but really what you're talking about is focused in on a target audience and providing the best possible first impression to that group. And so there's a handful of different examples. Uh, we've made uh, tar target audience sites in almost all these categories. But uh, workforce, industrial parks, right now housing um, is, a, is a huge one. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think we'll just uh, click through a couple of these. 
Um, here's an example of a microsite that Greater Irvine made for the Irvine Chamber, and it's totally designated for international. So if you are uh, from outside of the region, this is the site that they'll send you to to look into about exporting and foreign direct investment. And this was a this is actually a winner of an IEDC award recently. And another example of a microsite would be for a uh, like a business park. In this case, it's a Tiger Transfer. This is out of Wyoming. It's a large rail yard. And what's neat also about t uh, groups like this is although they, this might have their own own organization, uh, because the the site can uh, in this case is in part of the economic gateway, which is our website system, we can connect it to the economic development site. So if there is news that's being shared on the economic development site, it can also be shared and populated on the uh, targeted target um, the microsite and vice versa. So it helps for uh, keeping the sites current. Uh, there's a lot of work being put into workforce attraction right now. And this is a, another example one. This one's from Greater Dubuque. They put this gorgeous site together called Big Life, Small City. Your home in Dubuque. And it has all of the things about getting to know it, um, meeting people, and uh, getting all the resources for living there. So in terms of microsites for data specifically, we offer a number of different templates for what we think of as turnkey microsites, you know, something you can literally have up and running in a couple of days. Uh, you, there isn't a ton of room for customization, but they are ways to showcase at a glance your data tools as effectively as possible. And these nest beautifully within your existing website. They effectively become a data portal where everything gets highlighted. And one of the things that we always point out is this kind of redundancy that you can look for things up at the top. Some people like to, their eyes go there first, but they're also simultaneously available if you're looking down here. Um, and that's really important. Another one of our examples here, this is for Sheffield City Region in the UK. Uh, you you know, all of the clients, when they're using one of our microsite templates, get to upload their images, their colors, their logo. So they really look unique, very much like they are their own, as they are absolutely. Another one from Amarillo, Texas. Um, but they're very effective. They're very inexpensive, and they can be up and running in a couple of days. Aaron, this is a really exciting one. I'm I'm excited to learn more about geo personalization. Yeah, this is a this is something that's. Uh, brand new as far as uh, it's the depth of uh, the ability to geo-personalize something and it's also down the same path in the same way that you might make a microsite for a targeted audience it's about getting a lot more bang for your buck out of your website and so right now um, our economic development websites look an awful lot like this they wear an awful lot of hats so let's say you're in texas and uh, your community there and your website is something like all these different audiences it's trying to talk to about new companies for foreign direct investment. You've got entrepreneurs, you got your local stakeholders that are watching. You have all your local businesses now more than ever that are interested in support and people that are trying to, you're also trying to create jobs and attract the workforce. That's an awful lot of stuff uh, for making a really good first impression to all of them. So, Here's a site, or the site might say, your hero image is, our place is great. The feature is about this happy CEO and the success stories about a worker that moved there. That's a, from a disjointed um, uh, items. But with geo um, personalization, what if you knew that your traffic was coming from California? Well, if that's the case, you would want to, like if all your traffic came from California, wouldn't you want your website to look different? because you wouldn't necessarily be talking about everything that you would uh, normally. So in this case, I want to have stuff that's about attracting new companies, attracting entrepreneurs, attracting talent. Those are all strategies to apply to people that are, might be looking in from California. And I'd like my website to have a hero image about California business moves to town, or the feature is your top place to work. Or I loved moving here from California as a success story about a business that moved, which has um, been happening quite a bit recently. This is what geo-personalization does. It changes your website first impression and content based on where the people are coming from. If you know that the traffic's coming from Europe, why would you have stuff about, um, you know, uh, helping say entrepreneurs or doing workforce training or, or some of that? I mean, yes, that might be relevant, but really, if someone's looking from Europe, you're looking to, at foreign direct investment and attracting those companies into the area. And so wouldn't it be better that that company is going to see about 
a success story about another business that had an easy transition from Europe or why patients a great U.S. location. That's going to speak more to um, uh, uh, audience from Europe. And then on the flip side, what if you know that the traffic is inside your community or within a 40-minute radius or so something of that sort? then you don't need the foreign direct investment stuff. In fact, your local businesses want to see stuff about how you support them. And so why not have the site change to say, hey, we grow our business here. There's homegrown successes as the feature. There's jobs being created. Uh, there's all of the COVID-related pieces. Um, anything that, that comes in locally could really leave the best impression on the businesses locally. That's what the promise of geopersonalization. And um, I'll just give you a, just a quick example, visual example. This is using the Golden Shovel site. Here's our normal homepage. But if somebody comes over from California, they're going to see economic development marketing in the Golden State versus uh, economic development marketing. And that could be something else for southern states. We might change it for international projects. And um, But that's an example. And then not just the header images, but our testimonials could change. So these two testimonials would be from California. So that if somebody came over there, they'd see um, a messages related to them. And so if we're going to have all this content and all these success stories, why not feature the ones that will have the biggest impact on the people that are coming there based on your best assumptions? Which uh, that gets us into trend number four, a workforce attraction. And I can't say enough about how big of a deal this is right now, especially for rural regions. This is an article that came out in 2018. So more job openings than workers to fill them. That was the trend going into uh, the world of COVID. And now suddenly we're seeing articles like this. This is from September 2020. People for economic growth in smaller metros from Forbes um, or Get to the next one here. Seven reasons why 2021 will be even bigger and better for remote workers. So there's this massive shift that COVID has forced upon us all, which has put us in some really interesting situations. Um, you know, now suddenly people are working from home. Suddenly remote working is becoming a norm. And that's made the, one of the largest migrations of people, which is really focusing on that people are looking for a better quality of life. They're looking for more space. They're looking for these rural regions and these suburbs. And it's a great opportunity for uh, medium and smaller sized communities to really attract them and to put their, their uh, messages out forward. Um, the big issues right now for attracting remote workers is you need to have broadband, you need to have housing, and you have to have a great quality of life and a good cost of living. And that really um, sits to the benefit in, of an awful lot of uh, rural and mid-sized regions. So here's just a few examples of people that have been building sites just dedicated to attracting workforce. This is the Good Life, which is the Region 5 in Minnesota. And if you go into that site, they've got some really nice uh, success stories of different types of businesses and different types of people they're highlighting that uh, add to the quality of life of the region. There's a York County Development Corporation, which uh, put together a whole site and an entire campaign uh, all around uh, attracting talent there. Uh, there's the Greater Yankton Living. This is Yankton, South Dakota. They have an incredibly active community around their workforce attraction. This whole site's designed to help people get into the region and experience it. I want to highlight just a couple things inside this site. First of all, they have a lot of success stories of talent that's thriving there. These are the aspirational stories where, where the heroes are the people that are doing great. Uh, there's videos as part of those success stories, being able to go in there and learn more and see those people speak, see some photos and hear their story. They have a whole directory in here of volunteer opportunities in their region, especially if you have uh, trailing spouses or um, um, a lot of the younger generations that are moving back into communities are engaging the community in different ways than the older generations did. And having volunteer opportunities shows them how they can get involved. Uh, some of their creative approaches include this, the 
every March they do 31 under 31. And so they have a person that they highlight that's thriving in their region each day of that month. And what's so neat about this is not only are you highlighting somebody that's thriving, but you, that creates a piece of content that then those people can share through Facebook and with their friends and their families and send that message out. And you start attracting talent that's, um, uh, that they're aspirational to. What a great way to celebrate people in your community and get them all talking. And if you look at their web, their Facebook page, and right now they're at, as of yesterday, 19,530 followers. It gives you an idea just if they have oh. a message to share about what's great, it gets to 19,530 people. And that's an asset that they've built up over many years as they've been working on this and, and just staying consistent. All right, back to you, Alicia. Yeah, wow, that's, those are some great numbers. That's super exciting. Um, just example things that we're seeing in terms of workforce is what, the ability to feature and include that data in any of the tools so that when people are doing that analysis, they have it handy and they can combine it with the other things that they're looking at. So talent pool is one of the ones that we always come back to. We know how popular they are, especially to teams for internal use, but also for investors looking for that information. And of course we can add, if you're an MC subscriber, Shmura Job CQ, we have FDI markets and benchmarks. So you can add seven years of, uh, of foreign direct investment data by country, by sector, by jobs, by amount of investment, any other local data that you might actually have that you want to put in there, then we can definitely build that in. Uh, so that is really valuable when it comes to looking at that workforce information, being able to, uh, to provide that to investors. Um, another example that you can see is wage data, workforce data specifically. In this case, we're looking at Charlotte Regional, um, and you've got those links up on the top if you want to take a look and see how that plays out. Uh, again, super visual, super clear, and letting people make their own choices um, about what they're choosing to research. And analyze an example here from Florida Power and Lights uh, FDI data so that you can filter it out, you can map it out, and then you can share that by clicking on share uh, in a variety of formats on social media and email or with a unique share link that brings people back to the website. That's so important. You don't want that static uh, data reports. It's often not really that useful. I often say we get our best ideas from our clients, and there's a couple of examples. From, this is Lansing um, up in Michigan. What they've done is uh, layered in uh, local data, in this case, success stories, and they put that far up on, on top, but it's also a map layer. So you can click on those and get those stories built right into the map itself. So people can see a lot more interesting information in terms of storytelling about what's happening in the community and building it right into the tool. I love that, I think it's so clever. Um, another really interesting way we're doing that with local data, in this case, Greater Sacramento, is that you can search co-working spaces. We know, especially before the pandemic, how important that is. I expect once things return to our new normal, we will see a return to co-working spaces, especially as new entrepreneurs, startups, and smaller businesses seek places that they can uh, situate themselves. I think people may, some people may get tired of working from home at some point. Uh, that brings us to number three. I mean, there's no question, Aaron, I'm sure you'll agree that one of the things we're hearing from uh, economic developers all over the world, even if they're normally focused on foreign direct investment, is how their attention has turned to business retention and support. Everyone wants to do everything they can to support their local businesses. So one of the things we did when we uh, heard back in March and it, when, when everything first struck, our clients were saying how important this was to them as we very quickly turned around our Zoom business tool, which I spoke about a little bit at the beginning. Uh, we provide this without any charge at all to our existing clients, so there's no additional charge for them. Businesses can add themselves by clicking the add a business on the top right economic developers or chambers who want to, they can add in, in batches if they have a spreadsheet, it's possible to add in the back end. If businesses add or edit themselves, then you guys as the administrators of the site get a chance to review and approve just to make sure that everything is, uh, is copacetic. Um, and then we get to see these businesses promoting themselves. So as a consumer, I know that I will often choose to spend my money locally these days rather than going to uh, faceless online providers that transcend my community boundaries. I wanna keep the, the shops on our main street open. 
So this helps me find them. Uh, an example here from Fayette, Georgia, I think they've done a really beautiful job with the uh, images that they've put in there. So all of these are businesses that are open. You can click on open business up here at the top and filter it out to find what you're looking for. There's other kind of filters in there that you can look for as well. So really powerful way, it's very inexpensive. If you aren't a GIS planning client, very inexpensive to add this as well. If you are a client, then this comes with your Zoom Prospector tool if you want to use it. Um, and we're seeing actually that those kinds of things are going to be popular after COVID as well, because this gives you a listing literally of the businesses in your community, a way to build that rapport with them, to help keep them front and center on your website, but also to help connect people uh, to them. So I think this is something that we're likely to see persist after the pandemic ends. And I, I yeah, know that and COVID, COVID data and information has been really popular for your clients as well, right? Everyone wants to provide resources. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every single economic developer called to action when the pandemic started uh, saved the jobs of their local businesses. And although there was certainly a lot of BRNE strategies uh, across the board, um, there there should be, uh, most economic development organizations weren't in a real position to help all of the businesses, especially all the small businesses. There's rarely enough uh, uh, manpower to be able to uh, to hit them all. And so that's put a strong focus on utilizing the websites to be that that asset and that resource. Um, this Ramsey County, Minnesota, that covers the the St. Paul, the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, they put together a really excellent uh, COVID-19 resources page that's expanded into they have a full incentives directory that can communicate with um, all the incentives for the region and the communication with the workforce. Uh, we've seen a couple of uh, clients put together toolkits for businesses. Here's an example of a business toolbox in the city of Elk River. And then um, also utilizing just in order to get to and reach to so many more of these small businesses, um, being able to put in tools that, that allow them to use the website as themselves. And this is an example of a size up where they put all sorts of data analytics inside of here where a small business can go instead of um, basically being able to put in their like what their revenue proceeds will be they can find out what the traffic is on the roads they can get information on where they should locate their business and it gives them all sorts of data that previously was only really available to the larger consultancies and uh, now they can use it through the economic development organizations that support and these kinds of uh, Digital tool has been really powerful in supporting small. So yeah, just some more screenshots here from Size Up LBI. I know this is just a really useful tool for small, medium-sized businesses to be able to do this research for themselves. They may be doing this off business hours. They're probably not open. Uh, they're probably doing the work when you're no longer open and being able to feature this data front and center for them is just absolutely invaluable. They cannot pay for outside consulting and this can often make the dis difference between whether they can stay open or not. So it's a really example. I encourage you to check out the TriDeck example in the upper right when we share the slide deck with you. So Aaron, this brings us to number two, video and VR. I there's We just cannot say enough about how important, video is always important, but just critical this year. Absolutely, especially in that storytelling. I mean, we're at a situation where people can't visit places in person, and having all the uh, assets that video brings to the table, being able to incorporate sound, story, uh, visuals, uh, all together has been, big focus. And for us particularly, uh, we've really been uh, focusing on uh, some of the, the virtual reality and the spherical videos. What's neat about those is uh, being able to go into uh, a site and actually look around all around you. And I can give you a little example of that. These videos, um, although the 360 ones are used, can be used inside virtual reality goggles, they also can put right onto the website. So here on New York County, they've got a um, workforce attraction 360 spherical video on the top left and then the other three are standard videos that highlight uh, some of the uh, the uh, success stories of people thriving in their region and one of the neat things about the VR is that actually tricks your brain in this feeling like you're visiting or standing there and um, our focus thus far has been mainly on familiarization tours and site tours 
uh, now we're doing a lot more workforce attraction related pieces, but uh, especially since there's been such limited travel, this is a way to give people that feeling of standing in a place uh, when they can't, can't physically be there. And before we were using these a lot to the trade shows, people could bring them to the trade shows, but with those being scaled back, now they're more often either viewing them online or sending uh, goggles to site consultants or um, uh, business prospects in order to, to be able to view it. And I don't know if you have, a, I could give a really quick demonstration. I know we're running out of uh, time a little bit. Uh, do you think we have time for a few minute video or should we keep going, Elise? I don't want to. Um, I think we could we could show a few minutes of the video. I can play that on here, I believe, if you'd like me to show it. Okay, sure. Sounds good. Maybe just do some of the, the beginning of it. Wanted to give a little bit of example of what uh, the spherical video looks like. Uh, the, I don't know if you can hear any vo audio for this, but maybe you could speak to it. Yeah, I'm just going to talk over. So, um, yeah, so when you first get here, what we're doing is looking up and down. You can show how we can set the cameras up so you can see different seasons. Uh, it's great for tourism. You can show people. It's always sunny in VR. <laughs> and show off the events. Oftentimes events only happen once a year. But if you can capture it like you're there, then you can show it to people all year long. Uh, here's 250 horses running in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot focusing on sites, like how to show sites. I've been working with drones, uh, both for VR and standard video, and then taking brownfield and greenfield sites and come showing the buildings and the visions for what developments might be a good fit for those regions. Um, we've gotten pretty good at this. Uh, in this particular example, the train way over on the right is real, but the building on the left is not. Um, those tracks aren't real, the truck and all of that has been added, it's basically just a dirt lot. But then we wanted to show how this might work. We can bring in actual 3D models. The train on the right, not real, and the other one was, but it shows how you can show off a vision. And uh, this is where we work with existing facilities. We can use specialized cameras and shoot existing facilities, make entire 3D models by scanning them, and you can do so much. You can even go in here and I can measure, for example, this one spot inside this building, decide if a piece of equipment that you might need to put in there would fit. Or um, could just do all of this stuff from afar. Somebody overseas could explore and analyze your entire facility before ever setting foot in it. And then lastly, as far on the VR side, this is an older version. We have a new app just about to launch after this month. But this is uh, the Place VR Meetings app where you can take your guests and go inside your VR videos with them in 3D sound, like you're just standing next to them, and give them tours of your community without so actually physically uh, doing it in person. And so there's a couple of my uh, colleagues. I'm, having, I'm switching perspectives here, as so you can see what it looks like from the other side. But there's me and um, in the gray jacket. And I'm going to pull up a video and, and show them one. I'm going to pull up a 34 acre industrial site for York County, Nebraska. You can see the conference table disappeared inside here, but my guests are still there. So as it, you'll see that they're still hanging out and we're talking. We brought them to the Greenfield site and we're looking around. Their experience. This is all on video, so they actually can uh, uh, 
feels like they're standing there. We can add different types of graphics into it. So in this case, this was a building that's straight from the engineering firm Olson. They can check out the lot. And we can put inside the uh, inside the video the actual models itself and show what it might be like with a building existing. So here's an example of that uh, logistics center popping out of the ground. And there's another train. Um, so that's how we're utilizing the 3D models uh, to, to show these visions that the developers have or the engineering firms have. And you can bring people there as if it was already. That's pretty amazing. Right. Yep, I think All we right. can cut it short. Jump I think back we can to go slide. back to our, uh, our, let's see, we need to get back to, there we go. Um, so that's pretty amazing. Wow, that's really like next level, so immersive. Yeah, no kidding. It's a really cool experience to be inside there. Um, it really feels like sitting next to somebody. Well, one of the things that I love about all this thing it, it, w w that brings me actually as a segue into the is that we can build all this amazing new video technology into your uh, microsites and into your uh, interactive data tools. So an example here from Duke Energy, who's put, once you've got these beautiful videos, put them directly into your proposals, put them into your property reports. They're easy to add and they really make a difference uh, if you want to be able to showcase them. And that, I guess, takes us to the number one uh, trend that I, I would say is these virtual tours. We know, as we've said over and over again, because of the pandemic, travel restrictions mean people can't easily come to you. So we want to think about what you can specifically be doing to get out to them. That VR is just a phenomenal example of the things you could do virtually, but providing those digital walkthroughs, the immersive video, uh, the, the Matterport you know, interiors, interactive interiors is really just incredible. And we've tried to build that into this new product that we have called Zoom Tour, which lets people build their own interactive virtual tours. And basically, these are just points on a map. Each one is based on a theme. You can create as many tours as you want. And each tour can have as many stops as you want. And then you put this incredible media in there. You put images. You could put video. You can put audio. You can put um, you know, these immersive walkthroughs, 360 virtual flyovers. The data tools can be brought in there as well, along with the text here on the side. So we have an example here from uh, NISA in South Carolina, and they put a, built a virtual tour, and then they put it directly on their web page. You click on that, and it takes you over to their tour, and there's 11 different stops. Each one of them has all this information in there, so you can actually uh, go through. Let me see if I can open this up for you. You can then walk through the tour itself. Uh, you see that they've got audio information, and it lets people kind of view all the different things that are happening along the way. These are different images. You can see the data tools that bring that information up there. Uh, then there's the 360 view, so you can look around. And these theme-based tours let people make their way through the uh, the regions that you're looking at. It really helps people understand things better. And the thing that's amazing about these virtual tours is that you let people negotiate their own way through them, but you can build as many of them as you actually want to. And it doesn't have to just be about economic development. It can be about um, tourism. It can be for your conference board. It can be for your chamber of commerce. You could have a a walk down um, you know, the high street or the main street in your town to showcase the businesses that are there so that people get a chance to see what those actually look, look like. Uh, we have one client who's building them to showcase the uh, film and video in their area um, so that they can show film, uh, film locations um, and, and uh, attract people who are doing film and video production. And all of that is just really very, very powerful. So you've got these interactive walkthroughs kind of similar to what we were, uh, Aaron was showing. This is a, a different version of them. If you're using his Matterport tours, these are things that you can easily build in there. The more data you have, the better. And it's just a really exciting way for people to see how these actually work. Uh, we have an example one that we built for our, our holiday tour um, for GIS Planning. Holiday card this year was a tour where every member of the GIS Planning tool, uh, team picked a local business or area that was valuable to them. 
um, and we have a tour across the US of those different places. So you can build as many of them as you like. And the nice thing about them is you can then use them on social media. You can put them on your website. You can put them in proposals. You can put them uh, in email newsletters, in proposals, in emails. There's uh, presentations. Everyone's doing virtual presentations these days. They are basically effective presentations at a glance. And then the last part of the virtual tour piece that was really important this year is that we made 360 degree virtual tours um, automatically added for every single property for every single client who is using Zoom Prospector. You can see an example here uh, in Miami. So the virtual tour basically gives you a Google Earth flyover so you can see exactly what that looks like. Um, but we also give people the ability to add their own custom tours. If you are using technology like the one Aaron was just talking about to uh, produce immersive videos or interactive interior walkthroughs, that's fantastic. Maybe you have 3D architectural renderings or drone video or animations. All of that can be easily added. There's just a button you can choose to put in there and that will pay to take people directly um, to that space so they can go in and see it. There's another example here from Purdue um, that offers an interactive uh, an interactive tour. So the virtual tour is there. You've got the street view. We all know Google 3D rotation is super helpful, especially in an urban area. And now you have these other virtual tour options. So There's really makes it easier than ever for investors to see what these areas look like in your region. So uh, I know we've got a little bit over, but Aaron, this is our, our 10 top 10 trends walkthrough for this year. We had storytelling, um, which has new meaning, visualizing data, mobile, tracking and lead generation, microsites, geo-personalization, which is so cool, uh, workforce attraction, what that trend looks like these days, how we're supporting existing businesses when they need us more than ever, video and VR, and then of course, virtual tours. That's, that's a pretty impressive lineup of new trends. We've seen a lot of new things this year, haven't we? Wow, yep, we sure have. We have yet to get through all 10 things in under an hour, but boy, we tried. <laughs> Maybe 2022, that'll be our year. Yep. Um, <laughs> we will, are happy to take questions. Um, we do have a few that have uh, have come up in there. You'll also see our contact information is up here on the screen. Um, Chantal asks if, we, if the, we'll be sharing the slides after this. And yes, you'll be getting a follow-up email tomorrow with a link to the video, but also a link to the slide deck. We're happy to share that with you. Um, are we seeing more EDCs switch to business support retention expansion? And how would that change their website? Should they develop multiple websites? What do you think, Aaron? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. That goes really back to the decision about something with the geo personalization in order to alter the first impression of your support the people locally. Um, every single EDO is focused on. If they weren't before, and uh, if any, if anything's changed, they now have to stretch further. And in some cases, um, you know, get into even things around like workforce attraction. I was those types of, things. but um, absolutely the sites are changing. At the very least, they're building up sections that provide all the resources that local businesses need. Great. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you that resource, the information for the businesses and then the resources for businesses, I think is so important. Um, I know we're, we're running short on time, but I have one more question that I would like to ask. Uh, how often is Google changing their SEO algorithms and how often should EDO webmasters check to see what needs to be changed on their website to make up for that? Oh, my gosh. Right, right. Um, it happens more often than we'd like. <laughs> I'll just tell you that oh, because no. they're not exactly calling us up to tell us when they change them, uh, but we absolutely know when they do because we can see the results on traffic. So um, when those things happen, we uh, review in depth um, all of our sites and all of the traffic on a quarterly basis with the clients. And if we see anything that uh, uh, becomes a trend across all sites, look into it. So, um, but yes, it, it does happen usually once or twice a year. And sometimes they're significant, and sometimes they're very, very light. Um, a significant one would be, for example, if your site isn't mobile friendly, one one particular update, they decided if you're not mobile friendly, you're going to get lower rankings. Right. Well, that's what huge focus on everybody getting. 
more lately, if you don't have updated content or if your content isn't, uh, isn't meaningful, they, you get lower rankings. Um, and every time they decide to make an adjustment on how specific they're going to be, it affects the overall algorithm. And so it is our, uh, <laughs> it's certainly a full job keeping tabs on those guys uh, um, along with social media tools. Yeah, it can get pretty complex. So certainly making sure you don't have dead links and you have good content and good headers is always good practice. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think, Erin, this brings us to the end of our webinar. This was fun. I'm always happy to do this with you. And I'm so grateful for all of those of you who took time out of your busy days to join us. We appreciate the work you are doing for your communities. And I look yeah, forward thank to you. working Lisa, with thank you. Thanks, Erin. All right, be well. And we will be in touch with the video and with the slide deck. And uh, stay safe, everyone. Be well and take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.